Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Now, let's start the, the work of the forum. I don't know whether I should uh, introduce Denise Bombardier, whether I can, for those who've never read anything that she's written. Perhaps I could say that uh, she has uh, a moderate uh, appreciation of the French. It's, it's, um, it's a love-hate relationship, isn't it? It's uh, disappointed love, says Denise uh, Bombardier. Well, I'm sure you won't be disappointed, and I'm not going to uh, take her speaking time away because she's going to uh, moderate an exceptional roundtable. And I'm sure that, uh, I hope that at the end of this roundtable, her love will be slightly less disappointed than it is uh, as she starts. Denise, you have the floor. First of all, I've looked at the screen and I got the wrong glasses because uh, I looked at myself on the screen and I feel like, uh, look like Nana Muscari. Uh, that being said, if I didn't have my glasses on, I wouldn't see anything and that would be a real shame for the beginning of this discussion. The subject for this evening, no politics without culture. Now, uh, that sounds like uh, a gag because um, it sounds like it's true, but uh, the cocktail between politics and culture is pretty explosive, as we all know. One of the most explosive cocktails that exists because uh, the relations between politics and culture are complex, paradoxical, dangerous, and sometimes tremendously tremendously uh, rewarding for both uh, artists and politicians but I have guests here who will I'm sure uh, be going deal with this issue on the basis of their experience their sensitivities because they come from different parts of the world different countries different cultures, and let me introduce them to you straight away. First of all, Mr. Eric Orsena, who is a writer, who is a member of the French Académie Française. Eric, I could uh, talk about you for half an hour, but you're not the only one here. Eric Orsena, of course, you know. Among other things, he was uh, a cultural advisor to François Mitterrand when François Mitterrand was president of France. Then uh, we have uh, Mr. Chetan Bhagat, who is an Indian author, who is also uh, a speaker. And Mr. Bhagat uh, has written some very successful novels. His uh, novels have remained bestsellers and three of them have inspired Bollywood films. The Time magazine considers him as one of the 100 most influential people in the world. And uh, Mr. Badar Jafar, who is uh, the uh, chairman and CEO of Crescent Enterprises in the United Arab Emirates. He is uh, a defender of cultural diplomacy, and he has taken a number of initiatives in music, theater, and films to uh, promote uh, intercultural dialogue between the Arab world and other parts of the world. And he has been honored as a, as, a, as a young global leader by the World Economic Forum. Mr. Jaffa, please step up and join us. So I can now remove my glasses. Let's go straight into the subject. And I'm going to ask uh, Monsieur Orsena, first of all, to lead off discuss and with with the uh, the audience also 
Alors, je vais demander à M. Orsena. Let me ask Mr. Orsena to lead off, as I said. Can he um, start the, the ball rolling? Thank you very much, Madame Bombardier. I'm um, very happy. And as culture is a long-term thing, uh, I'm happy to just take five minutes to introduce it. But five minutes will be enough. My conviction is that more than ever, we need culture. The world is uh, moving from one universe to another. Uh, so the world is unstable. When you have a stable world, we need less culture. We saw that in literature in the 1960s. Everything was fine and uh, formalism was uh, the watchword and people could write novels they called new novels. But the, the need for culture is absolutely essential when the world is going through a metamorphosis. And we are going through a metamorphosis at the moment because we have to understand more than we've ever understood before those that, that the new world leads to violence. And if we don't understand that violence, then it will get out of hand. And what's very interesting is to try and find the places where culture is being produced today and where culture is being uh, presented and listened to today. Bilbao is the example we heard of earlier on, but uh, I travel a lot in the world and in France and everywhere. Cities like uh, Avignon here are places which host cultural events because people know and need culture because uh, they need culture for their, uh, for, for their pride. Uh, Metz uh, used to be a military garrison. The new Beaubourg Museum was built in Metz and uh, people became proud of Metz once again. Marseille has got a new museum and there is uh, a real link between the changes in the world and new culture. And there is uh, a dynamics going on here. I was in Hamburg the other day and that is the same. And uh, central states are uh, becoming very depressed. Centralized straits are on their way out. How come that the sum of their energy uh, manages to uh, lead to national depressions everywhere? And I think it's because the centralized states are no longer working properly. And my question about power is this. What about the centralized state? The centralized state has practically no power left, but pretends it does. It is uh, making people more and more disappointed in democracy, more and more turning away from democracy because uh, the centralized state seems to have a lot of power, but the only power it has is to raise taxes these days. And therefore, what is the point of the centralized state today? Going further than that and posing a more direct question, what is the point of a minister of culture in a state today? Is a minister of culture useful for anything. There is something which is, which is essential, education, protecting heritage, uh, determining the rules of the game between the market and the non-market, between the short term and the long term. That is the role of a ministry. But do we need these uh, top heavy administrations that have been created for other era for other budget with other budgets and for other purposes? I chair the Center for the Sea in Rochefort. And uh, we are um, producing a replica of Lafayette's ship. And in a city of 40,000 people, we host 400,000 people every year. And I have to consult the uh, National Ministry of Culture to tell me that uh, my uh, subsidy has uh, now been reduced from 6,700 euros to 6,400 euros. So my question is, the regional directorates for cultural action of the centralized ministries, are they worth anything? The great administrative, uh, the great administrative structure of France is not only a bad thing because it costs too much, but the more structures you have, uh, the less you know what each one of them does. It costs an awful lot and it leads to a general system of powerlessness. So what I'm interested in is a vision, is a narrative. Let's uh, look at the European level now. It is true that the nation states, of course, uh, are uh, pretty down in the mouth. But Europe is uh, the butt of jokes and anger by all of our citizens for many years. Uh, there was uh, talk of uh, removing the Erasmus program. What would remain of Europe if we didn't have an Erasmus program? 
we would have continued to, uh, to have uh, two sorts of young people, young people who can travel and young people who can't. Young people who can travel are interested in travel, opening their minds, culture, generosity, and the rest of it. And the other set of young people uh, can't stand foreigners, whoever they are, because they never get out of their country. So my proposal is very simple. Instead of uh, getting rid of Erasmus, we should multiply it by three or four, first and foremost. But to give uh, culture to politics, we must also impose Erasmus on our politicians. No politician should have a national mandate in uh, their national countries without having spent at least a year in another country. That's my proposal. Well, that is uh, in the heart, the heart of the matter, and uh, you're going to uh, put a few more nails in the coffin later on, aren't you? Yes, I've got plenty of nails, and I come from a, a society, from a company which is more metaphorical than real, Quebec, uh, where culture doesn't get any more subsidies at all, and if we don't have culture, without our culture, only with politics, I wouldn't be here talking French because it is uh, the creators who uh, contribute uh, to the energy of uh, the country, who've been able to express the views of the people. General de Gaulle, General de Gaulle was an artist too, and uh, we appreciated him, but also our local creators, our local artists. General de Gaulle said one single sentence on a balcony, but it was a better than a lot many other sentences. But uh, it still resonates in our ears, doesn't it? He didn't dis disappoint you, did he? No, he never disappointed us. No, he doesn't disappoint us. Um, but uh, I've uh, had uh, plenty of disappointments with France, but I've had, it, I've had plenty of disappointments with Quebec too. And uh, I ended up by marrying an Englishman, the conqueror, would you believe? But he's here. He's here. And he's a specialist of the French 18th century. And if he wasn't a specialist in France of the 18th century, he would never have met, you see? So culture leads, leads to, uh, to us meeting, leads to love. Now, I would now like... Jaffa, to... I have a question for you. How would you define culture nowadays? Well, for me, and uh, again, with a very sort of strong... Well, first of all, I'd like to apologize for speaking in English while, while being in France. It's very uncultured of me. Uh, Thank you so, to apologize. We so, love that. <laughs> I heard. <laughs> but uh, no, for me, it's really what represents uh, a people. And, and that can come in many shapes and forms, obviously, their music, their food, their language, but also the way in which they're educated, their language, but not necessarily the words themselves, but the way in which they express themselves. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, in a nutshell, but there's, it, it can go very deep, obviously. Um, so if I may just give you some context about uh, my perceptions from the Middle East perspective. And for most international uh, observers, the Middle East is represented more by its, its problems. Uh, and maybe misunderstood by its problems, uh, issues such as sectarian conflict, uh, you know, youth unemployment, women's rights, uh, or the lack of it at times, uh, and the list goes on. And I genuinely feel that's a huge shame because that's in stark contrast to say how a region like Europe, uh, for example, uh, you know, might be perceived. Uh, many who have never set foot in France uh, may have a, a deep understanding of this country from the people who are exposed to France's enormous. Uh, you know, sort of cultural influence on the world. Uh, again, people in America might have a love for Italy uh, without even having visited the, the country, not necessarily because of their admiration, because of, you know, characters like Berlusconi, but more for their maybe love of uh, Pavarotti or even something simple such as in enjoying pat, you know, pasta or pizza. Um, and I think, of course, that that theme uh, you know, it applies as you go everywhere in the world. Um, so people really have an intrinsic uh, understanding of what these countries stand for from the perceptions they develop about their culture. And like I said, could be their food, their music, traditions, pastimes, you know, sometimes even celebrities who represent 
uh, a certain culture. And of course, their brands, which is something extremely important, which I'll come to. So for me, culture is really the most powerful form of language. Uh, the most powerful form of communication, which can be understood and really cuts across borders uh, as, as well, let's say, most, more powerful than anything else, in my opinion. Um, and again, it's a way for strangers to understand a society, engage its values, and then perhaps uh, empathize with its politics. Um, and so, again, as I said, at, a, at, at, the, at the best, it can be really an important bridge uh, between uh, two sometimes seemingly diametrically opposed um, societies. Now, again, going back to uh, the Middle East, I think many of the cultural traits associated with the Middle East are placed in a negative context, like the sometimes, you know, uh, you know, some, like the often misunderstanding, like the association between headscarves and women's rights, or uh, and you know the more positive associations uh, seem to be far and few between, uh, and made you know things like falafel, which is very tasty, which I hope a region uh, as rich in history as the Middle East can be uh, known for more. Um, so for me, again, like I said, it's a force that countries in the Middle East have been unable, in my opinion, to harness uh, successfully uh, yet. Um, but again, uh, to give you a couple of specific examples, if I may, if I have a couple more minutes left. Uh, so take the UAE, for example. And the UAE, which is the country where I'm from, uh, is incredibly welcoming of other cultures, which is why I think they'll be a great host for something like the Expo 2020, which is coming up. And I thank France for its endorsement. Um, the UAE legal system is obviously very heavy, heavily influenced by the French Civil Code. Our historic links to the UK are evident. Uh, but as much as the Arab world has been successful in embracing cultures, uh, from other parts of the world. Historically and even more contemporarily, uh, I think we haven't been successful at exporting uh, many of our own wonderful brands, foods, music, and films. If you walk along, you know, along any high street in the world, uh, some of the major you know, sort of, uh, centers of the world, in Paris or in London or New York or Shanghai, you'll be hard pressed to, 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 hard pressed to find uh, a brand or an Arab brand or if you go in any sort of uh, music shop it'll be you know outside the Arab world it's not easy to find that sort of music or indeed film so I think this is something which has tremendous value and for me it's really about harnessing cultural diplomacy so it's almost having culture uh, lead perceptions which ultimately will have inevitably an impact on the politics don't you think that uh, the expressions of culture can be threatened by the absence of freedom in societies? Uh, the expressions of culture can be threatened. Well, in, in, in some ways, the expressions of culture are actually amplified because sometimes through a uh, hardship of any nature, you can talk about human rights, you can talk about many other forms of hardship that exists. It can be socio-economic, it can be demographic, it can be socio-political, but that's sometimes the the most fertile breeding ground for some of the most beautiful content of culture that develops. And this happens, and I think historically you've seen that in many different parts of the world. So there's also a way to look at it in a positive light. Mr. Um, Bagat, I know that you have a presentation before yeah. talking to us. Yes. Hi. Hi, I'm Chetan. I'm from India and I'm a writer. Um, I write stories, so I thought I'll tell you a story about power and culture because I'm not as smart as some of the people here. So, you know, it's better to get away, not even try. And I'm also sorry to speak in English. We had 250 years of British rule. So, you know, <laughs> unfortunately, Pondicherry is a much nicer place than the rest of India. But, you know, you guys should have worked a little harder and occupied a little more. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I'll, uh, please excuse me if I go over one or two minutes. But I, I wasn't a writer to begin with. I worked in Goldman Sachs and Deutsche Bank. I was an investment banking in Hong Kong and in the, saw a lot of economies grow. And later I became a writer. And this topic is very close to my heart because this is what I do in my work. Um, wherever I used to go, including if I hang out with you guys, I'm sure over coffee, people say this, that what is wrong with India, right? Because we have very smart people. Indians are so smart. Not me, but many of us, uh, and we have the we have a good language to integrate with the world. English, whatever you might say, it helps get through the door some places. And it we have a lot of education. We have a legal system. Everything. Yet India is poor, and every 
economist here has written articles or read articles on India has so much potential. But we just have potential. We are not getting our act together. I don't want to show hundreds of figures, and this is probably the only graph I'll show here. But roughly, even China is four times per capita than us. I'm not even comparing with European countries. So there is something wrong there. Let's face it. Okay, so the popular narrative so far, and there is a lot of popular culture in India, Bollywood, things like that, is, I think this is the same everywhere. All that is wrong with the country is the fault of bad politicians, right? And that is a very, very common narrative in India. This picture is from a Bollywood movie. The guy looks evil, doesn't he? And he, and this is still one of the more good-looking guys. The, the ugliest people are politicians in our movies. It's just that as if there is a species which is separate from humans, which is politicians, who come out there, rule us, and spoil it all for us. <laughs> so it's somewhat wrong, obviously, and this is but what it has been. Indian politics so far has been on religion, class, and caste. This is a very senior minister once told me that Chetan, politics in India works on only these three things. When you want to ask for a vote, ask for a vote on religion or on your class, rich or poor, or caste. We have a caste system uh, which is very complicated. And also dynasty. Because I think, uh, because that caste and class are important, we like it. Where, where do you come from? Was your, who was your father? And therefore, these things obviously have nothing to do with governance on how to make India increase its per capita income or things like that. But this is what has got people votes so far. We have two main parties, Congress and the BJP. Congress has been in power 60 out of 67 years, so they are obviously doing something right in terms of being in power. This is the fourth generation Gandhi family. Our first prime minister's daughter, first prime minister was prime minister for a long time. The daughter was a prime minister for a long time. The daughter's son was a prime minister for a long time. And the son's wife is Italian, as you know. She almost came to power. She decided to make her son the prime minister. It doesn't feel like a democracy, right? But it's working. 60 out of 67, you've got to give them that. Because they get their thing, which a very common term in Indian politics is vote banks. Literally people who vote in block, blocks. Muslims poor votes, caste-based votes, Congress gets it right. We might criticize them a lot back home, but they get it right again and again. The BJP is the more middle class, they're trying the Hindu majority thing, they're catching up, they somehow, they're gaining traction now, but it's not worked as well. Well, all this is great, but what is the consequences? We have had monumental scams. I know there are corruption and everything in Europe, but you have no idea what we have. We have like $40 billion scams. I mean, seriously, the poorest country, one of the poorest countries in the world. And if you look at our scams, we, all our scams make it to the Forbes list. So, and there is a lot of poverty still, right? There's half of India, in, depending on where you draw the line. And there's a very poor governance. Now, this is something all that has been blamed on the bad politicians. But there have been some changes in the last few years, which has made people like me, the fact that people like me, are read in wide numbers is a sign that something has changed. Of course, these Twitter, Facebook, media power, and there is a lot of frustration because ultimately, if you don't do a good job, there's a lot of youth out there which doesn't get what they are due in life. So some, this has led to movements for new anti-corruption law. You may have heard, seen it in the pictures, like the Arab Spring, not quite a revolution, but there was a lot of movements two years ago on people wanting new anti-corruption laws there have been a few arrests. All three guys here are politicians. They're all in jail, uh, but not a lot of them. Just a few of them. They were not politically very useful to the people in power. That was partly to do with why they were gone. But not much has changed. We still don't have those laws. The government did some lip service. A lot of freebie policies work during elections. This election year coming early next year. So literally, somebody's proposed giving out 30 million mobile phones to people and somebody's thinking of giving gold earrings to all the women. Literally, I'm not joking, I'm not making them up. These are the kind of policies that help people win vote. And there is no evidence yet in election results that we are actually looking for some different kind of government than what we have so far. What will truly change India? Now, for people like me, this is the real challenge. We have to change the culture. We have to change the culture because that changes the voting pattern, that changes the politics, and that leads to the true change. On the surface, you can shame a politician, but it will not really change anything if people 
uh, don't really change within. And herein, I have to turn against my own audience, the audience that has given me this stage in India of millions and millions of people listening to me. I have to tell them something's wrong with you, buddy. And the real issue is bad us. It's not bad politicians. And this is a tough one because I don't want them to kick me out of the room because I, they don't like what I tell them. But they know that we all need this. We need a big, great Indian psychotherapy, which our artists need to do. So far, our artists have done song and dance numbers. All those will continue. But there are some real problems with the Indian psyche at the, same, at the cost of stereotyping a little bit. There is civility. You know, some say it's because of the British, 250 years, they made us say yes, sir, a lot. I don't know if it's that. Some say it's our education system. Some say it's uh, various ways, caste system, many, many reasons. But there is that tendency in us to take orders. We like taking orders. We don't like to lead so much. Uh, there is a numbness to injustice. Anybody who's visited India, you see poverty all around you and you see richness. You see it and you get used to it. The only way human body copes, that's not mine. Uh, someone made it up? <laughs> okay, that's nice. So, oh, this is part of the presentation. Thank you. Okay, this is a live drawing. And divisiveness. We, like, you know, we are literally I know you guys have your pride about who's from Paris and who's from Marseille and who's from Avignon, but you guys will not start fighting with each other over it to the point that, you know, there'll be some, he's like, don't be so sure. <laughs> and we are very divisive in that way. It's very easy to cut ourselves because there was no India, you know. Before the British, there was like so many of little, little kingdoms. So the idea of India itself is, so these three things need to be fixed. My work, obviously many of you are not familiar with my work here, but these are this film, Three Idiots, you may have heard out. I try to address these three exact issues, civility, in film about our education system, about three kids who rebel. Um, revolution 2020 was about a revolution, corruption. And I did a film on the Hindu-Muslim religious conflict on this. And these films all were well accepted. That means somewhere down the line, people are realizing, if told in a nice, interesting manner, that there is something within us which is wrong. If we don't change that, we'll keep throwing out bad politicians up at the top. And this is what's happening in India today. Does it work? The question is, does it work? The point is, these are very hard to measure things. But I'll just end with one evidence, and thank you for being so patient. You know, I tweet, everybody is tweeting these days, and one of the things that were literally the Congress proposed recently was let's ban opinion polls, because they were uh, losing in those opinion polls. So they said these are obviously wrong. So I gave this tweet, ban opinion polls, better ban opinions, or best ban polls, right? And it, uh, this obviously uh, was written by me, but next day, this is our Prime Minister candidate of the opposition party. He gave a blog and he took that tweet and put it in there. And just below that, you can, it's very hard to read that line. We say, friends, in that humor, there's a profound message. Now, these are our pre Prime Minister candidates who are now picking up on popular culture. And we are getting our own seat on the table to fix these guys a little bit, right? And it is great that this has ha started happening in India. It's still less. But ultimately, when we change ourselves and the politicians think this change is coming, they will change themselves too. So yeah, it is true that no change without politics, but there's no politics without culture. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bagat. <laughs> and as I can see, you're not discouraged at all. Huh? You're not discouraged at all. No. It is, of course, it's full of discourage in what way, sorry? In uh, discouraged by the politics of mm -hmm. our country, it's very, very disheartening sometimes. Especially, you know, when you've worked abroad, lived abroad for so long, like a place like Hong Kong, and then you come to India and see so much mismanagement, and people in power are, I mean, abusing it to, there's a little bit of abuse, I think everybody, India is okay with, we have this 7% rule. Nobody says anything to a politician if you take 7%. But, you know, you can't take 37%, mm -hmm. or you can't do no work. And but, but it gives you more power as, as a writer. Yeah. They are my muse. Yes. They are my muse. And I think it's a great time to be an artist in India if you are affected by these things. And I think the people of India are, their leadership is letting them down so much. And not just me, many popular figures mm -hmm. have become important voices because the people who are supposed to be those people are not doing their job. And sometimes it has its downfall because I am not supposed to behave like a politician, which is never a good thing, you know. 
Eric Orsena, est-ce que si les, les artistes... Eric Orsena, if artists and French, French artists and creators, if they were more vigilant and less uh, complacent, would politicians be more shaken by them? Well, I don't know whether they are vigilant, but I'd like to say two or three things on uh, what's just been said. What I think is interesting is that we have a new business, a new business line here, new jobs for young people, psychotherapy of people, because uh, you have uh, a little job there, and I would imagine with uh, the billions of Indians, the number of uh, couches you need in India for all the Indians to be psycho psychotherapied, uh, so you'd have a business making uh, couches there. So we need uh, a new to uh, develop that new business to uh, uh, to uh, teach uh, politicians uh, to uh, change and to teach people to change as well. So psych psychotherapy would be very interesting. But what's very interesting to me is the question of democracy, because democracy is a real culture. And I remember having. Uh, uh, put a question to a Chinese minister. He said, didn't you think uh, that there would be competition from the Indians? And he said, India is too complicated. And they lose far too much time building democracy, which is so much so complicated elsewhere. And in India, it'll take a thousand years. So for a thousand years, we've got no problems. That's what the Chinese minister said. So the question of democracy. And as democracy is a kind of a very fragile thing, uh, there is, a, there is a, a question, a real question there. Let's go a bit further and talk about corruption. If you take uh, one of uh, the key moments of growth in France, nobody was more corrupt than Colbert under Louis XIV. Uh, Colbert uh, uh, didn't know the difference between his own wallet and, and uh, the budget of the state. But it was a way of keeping French savings in the country. And if it was in other countries, uh, like Africa, um, the uh, African leaders um, pinched money from their countries and then came to live in Europe. But confidence is extremely difficult to build up, and you need something to trigger it. And it could be a writer or a few writers to trigger that confidence, or it could be growth. I'm absolutely fascinated and terrified by the situation in the Sahel that I work on at the moment. Mali and Niger are the only two countries in the world where there is no uh, demographic transition. There are 6.7 to 6.8 children per women. Other countries have managed fairly quickly to uh, reduce the demographic pressure fairly quickly. And there's the example of Iran, which is another very interesting ex example. Because uh, at one point, uh, before international sanctions and all the rest of it in Iran, where there was the beginning of a real development, real economic growth, and what families thought, <clears throat> and even men dominating women, uh, they said it's better to uh, have m fewer and better educated children than more children. And they said, we will perhaps uh, have a better future if we have fewer, better educated children. <clears throat> so as soon as there is an opening, as soon as there is a possibility, the culture changes. And even in situations where women are completely dominated, suddenly uh, they say, uh, they, they, they find that there is a kind of respect for women. So you have a very complicated relationship between the economy, growth, culture, democracy, dem demography, <clears throat> and that weave is very different from country to country. And that's why when you're a writer like you and I are, and we try and look at reality, it's absolutely necessary today to have a very wide general education <clears throat> because uh, the world is linked together. The world is a glo globalized world. But we must try and drive out the cliches because what is good for one country is not good for another. So uh, never sweeping statements because there's no single recipe. Yes, Mr. Jafar. Yeah, no, I, I would uh, absolutely agree. And I think this is some of the problems that we've faced in uh, the Middle East and North Africa is where there has been this uh, cookie-cutter approach to start to trying to solve certain issues and some very deep uh, entrenched issues, uh, such as the, you know, the certain uh, recent campaigns for you know, democracy, which have been uh, failures, unfortunately, because I think the underlying, and again, speaking as a, as a businessman, the underlying issues was, and I think it would have been much more successful if instead there were a drive towards simply rule of law.
because in uh, you know relation-based economies uh, such as in the Middle East and I think you know partly to an extent like India as well to switch to a rule-based economy overnight is not something that's difficult it can cause a lot of disruption and indeed harm a lot more people than it will help so in fact you have too much money well, you see, uh, people tend to assume the Middle East is, uh, or the Arab world is one, uh, but I assure you we have plenty of poverty. <laughs> but beyond that, what I'm trying to say is, with respect to the rule of law, and what's very important is, uh, and again, with, uh, related to the fact that we need to really encourage uh, economic development. We have a demographic time bomb in the Arab world today. We have uh, a huge, uh, you know, the largest youth unemployment in the world, and this is this is the biggest risk that we're facing, and the whole uh, future of, of the region is, uh, is, is at risk here. And again, it's not just about how the region might react internally, it's the impact that that might have to other parts of the world, uh, including issues such as extremism uh, and other forms. Uh, but just on the issue of corruption, Again, you know, I, I'd established something called the Pearl Initiative, which is uh, trying to uh, find the, uh, the economic imperative uh, towards establishing best practices and governance practices, and corruption is one of the biggest issues. And what we found is it is uh, really indeed a cultural shift that's needed. Um, but before you, you, you try and, and deal with that, it's, you have any problem before you try and solve it, you first need, need to define it. And what we found in, uh, when we were doing uh, a number of surveys at the start is the concept of corruption varied, uh, varied widely as you went across uh, the room. And this is not just an issue between East and West. You know, certain practices in America, say, during the presidential campaign contributions that were raised, the two, three billion uh, you know, dollar, that would have been uh, considered, say, in, in, in Europe or France illegal and would have be, could be jailed for certain practices of you know raising money there of, of, of that nature. So I think it's uh, it's always finding uh, to pick up on your point uh, culturally relevant uh, and uh, locally sensitive solution uh, to these issues and that I don't think is being done enough. Sur sur ce point on, on, on that issue. We very often raise the question why Africa took so much time to develop. And one of the explanations, which I think is uh, as good as any other, is that when you're an African, and I am familiar with West Africa, and you are successful, uh, you're successful in your business ventures, you're appointed a minister. And as soon as you've been successful, you have your family, and it's your African family, in other words, 300 people who come and see you. And you uh, distribute money to your family, and if you do that, you remain in the community, or you don't give the money, and you're rejected from the community. And uh, it's being, it's worse than death. It's a fate worse than death, a fate worse than, uh, and you're considered dishonest for not giving money to your family. So there is a, a preference for the family rather than for the, rather than society. There is a preference for short term rather than long term and investment. And it's the inverse of Max Weber. It's the uh, reverse of the Protestant work ethic. And there's a very interesting paradox there. We don't have enough social cohesion, but in other parts of the world, there's too much social cohesion. It's very difficult to find the balance between the two. Yeah. No, I agree with the points all of you made. Obviously, there is, on your first point, it always comes up, China says, and even many in India believe that, uh, you know, the democracy is, is what we're paying for. We're paying the big bill. But, you know, uh, it's, uh, and I think that's where all you people, all you influential people in Europe must realize we must never compromise on that. Because I, I, you can't use Facebook in, in China, and in, there are these basic things, the kind of stuff on opinion polls, that, uh, the kind of tweets we do. It's, democracy is something which requires, certain, assumes that people are good, and people are informed and well-educated, and culturally, they have to be culturally tuned to do the right democracy, but we can never give up democracy for sure. I mean, there is, that will be a bigger nightmare. Sometimes a benign dictator does a great job, but that doesn't justify dictatorship, I think. And so India will have to learn the slow way, and it's okay, you know, it's okay to, I, I'd rather have my kids use Facebook tomorrow than have 10% better salary. And it's just an individual choice, but I think if, if in India those freedoms were taken away, I mean, it could lead to a very bad society. And I, I think eventually we'll catch up. I think we will get there, and I think uh, there'll be more business to be done in India. 
uh, than in China. But I agree, there is no one solution. But what is happening in India often is that there are too many experts recommending better policies, better laws. Very, very, this is, I think, one of the first discussions on, like, uh, even I, where I've had to contribute on culture playing a role in corruption. Now you're saying that you have also already seen work that culture plays a role. And there is no one, I, I agree, there is no one solution. It's going to be slow for a place like India. But we sometimes we have too many people at the top who just recommend change this policy, open the economy, open this. No, it's not that simple. People have to want to change things. You have to tell people that there'll be a better tomorrow if you change this. And until they are on board, you can keep changing the laws. You could be the smartest guy up top. Um, and I've seen bankers go and give presentations, and I have done those in the past, and with no idea of what's going on really in people's minds. And until people really want it, it's, it's not going to happen. Eric Osana, how do you explain that uh, a country which is a country of culture, which has been born by culture, by literature, born up by it, how come that this country, in terms of uh, the culture budget, the, the culture, the cultural budget is uh, far worse than it used to be in a government which says that it defends the culture. It defends culture. In Quebec, it's the same thing. The global budget for the Ministry of Culture in Quebec is down. I was talking to the minister last week because I wanted to check the figures, and he said, uh, no, no, it's not that. It's just that I haven't been increased. And if uh, there hasn't been an increase, then it's been a decrease. So why is the situation in, why is that situation in France? Yes. Yes, but what I was saying previously is this. Could we not redefine the role of the Ministry of Culture? You don't need to have the Ministry of Culture of 50 years ago. The questions aren't the same. The cultural creation is not the same. You have internet, you have digital, uh, and all the rest of it. So why do we still have to have an outdated structure? What strikes me in France is that we tend to consider that what we have experienced many, many years and centuries ago is still going on and will continue for the next few centuries. You know, we have eternity before us. And I would imagine that uh, a ministry of culture, a minister of culture, could say, "Let's, let's uh, start again. Let's ha have a clean slate. I want to do this, and I need so much to do this." I think that a minister of culture who would say that would defend his budget a lot better from uh, the finance people than he does at the moment. So that's the first thing. Second thing, which I think is a real, real question, is this: You have a head of state in France which who does everything and uh, from what everything flows some of the some of our heads of state thinks that culture is important some of them thinks that culture isn't important i was the cultural advisor to francois mitterrand and i'm very lucky to have been that because francois mitterrand thought that to change people's lives you had to change it through culture and he put a lot of money uh, into culture and I, of course he had a lot of money to give but uh, things were different then but it, that's the what that's the way he felt anyway a lot of people uh, thought that Francois Mitterrand was too cultured. He knew uh, too much about history and uh, the history of Serbia. And uh, because he knew a lot about Serbia, when Serbia and the ex-Yugoslavia exploded, he made the wrong decisions. But I think uh, it's also true to say that our current president is not cultured enough. And I think a narrative is culture. Narrative is history. And a nation is not the sum of technical solutions. The nation is its culture. It's not just a question of algebra. It goes beyond that. There's a vision. There must be a vision. When you have a vision, you're prepared to uh, uh, have tactical retreats, to retreat here, to sacrifice things there. But you know where you're going. And uh, it's not just a question of the budget of culture. If we had said, for instance, and we can still say it, for instance, France is a kind of huge Bilbao, and we're going to um, merge our energies and go forward like Bilbao has. Fine. Why? But why? To uh, to, 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 to uh, that. I think we have to overhaul the old world, as I said. The, the old world is uh, over. And uh, I, I really want to, to uh, kick a lot of people's ass, I must say, in France, because um, my right foot is itching.
point because again this is something which we're faced with if you ask who holds the, the you know the seat of culture say in the Arab world and in particular where say the Gulf region where the center of gravity has moved in the recent times the government has been at the forefront of that of that of that movement and that development but that's where I see a major risk because it's not it's not really sustainable and this is where I think again speaking on behalf of the private sector I think this is where the private sector has a phenomenal opportunity really as a form of you can call it social enterprise Prize, but to get much more engaged in that cultural process, that cultural revolution. I mean, you take the U.S. for example, and you know, one of the only countries in the world that doesn't have a cultural minister or a ministry of culture. But how 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 successful has the U.S. been at exporting? It's the largest music industry in the world, the largest film industry in the world by value, not the number of movies. Um, and indeed, uh, you know, one of the largest fashion industries. You know, unfortunately, also very successful exporting food. Uh, but I think the you know, the, the issue is, uh, it's not just, uh, and if we have an over-reliance on government, then I think that that's uh, a danger. And the danger, especially when you have the austerity, as we've seen in Europe in recent times, is the first thing to go. So I think, again, talking from my part of the world, it's really, and I know this is a bit of a cliche, but it's a, it really is a stakeholder uh, engagement. You need not just the public sector, but I like to say it's sort of led by the private sector, enabled by the public sector and ultimately for the people uh, and that's something which I think is a, is a useful model. Yes, what is the role of the private sector in culture in your country? Well, I think the culture carriers or the culture keepers in a country have not realized their power yet. They were a lot like entertainers. Uh, you would not find, I'm giving popular examples, but like let's say someone like a Bono in the US or a George Clooney, they openly air their political views. Uh, it doesn't happen in India. There's a lot of fear of retribution and anybody fairly popular will not say a word. Uh, a lot of movies are now, for example, the movie makers are all private, right? And it's, it, it, and culture doesn't mean high culture, especially when it comes to politics, it's the l pop culture which is going to affect. And the movie makers, very few now are realizing their true power of their work because they're, they're literally, they were entertainers. They were literally the people who, who entertain everybody and they are not seeing themselves as, uh, I think something very funny came up. I don't know. I think it was, I don't know. Uh, so I think the private sector is, is scared. The private sector... Scared of what? Of politics. They're very scared in India to do business. You cannot piss off the... So, yes, of course, because they have link with the, the yeah, power. Yeah, I mean, there, there sometimes... And corruption is between politics and, and private yeah. sectors. That we know that Correct. Also. And it, so there is a lot of free press, there's a lot of everything, but at the same time, uh, there is a fear, at least in the businesses, that they'll come after us. And it's very easy to come after companies, you know. So it's unfortunately, it's, it's not there, but these ideas have to be first floated in India. People don't even realize that we have a role to play. The culture carriers feel that we are just, let's figure out how to make money or let's, you know. But there are, once they realize, I think it will be a huge thing, which is where we will gain much faster than China, I feel, once that culture of, culture of using culture comes in. You know, it's it's not come in yet. And then once that happens, it, it can change things very, very fast. Whereas in a place like China, we, how do you change things? I mean, how? If you're not happy with something, how do you change it? Okay, they have a great economic growth, but who can, where do you go to complain? Where, where do you go? Oui, Eric. Oui, moi je pense que... Well, I think uh, that uh, there are missions um, of public good in culture and that the private sector can't settle. Uh, the, the, um, the, the public sector has to settle uh, who does what, uh, the rules of the game. There's the question of copyright, uh, Pierre Lescure's issue. Um, and I don't, I don't know uh, what his mission has um, led to. Uh, a, a minister asked him for a report and has not drew, learnt any lessons from it. So uh, he's made good recommendations and nobody applies them. So the questions are the rules of the game. That's what the public sector has to do. The state, too, must guarantee the long term. The long term. 
must uh, the uh, must guarantee must be the master of time because the market uh, is uh, clearly something which has to be profitable and therefore the market is in the short term and the market therefore is uh, goes this way that way and the markets are not the master of time uh, there is uh, a focus on the short term and the markets are the are the hostage of the short time the um, the public sector has to uh, educate has to maintain the heritage in an old country like uh, like the country in Europe so that's what the state has to do and there's another thing which i think is very very important which is this in every sector particularly in the private sector you have an obligation to evaluate and in the public sector in France you have rules that you can't uh, disobey budgetary rules but nobody evaluates anything and there is a very French originality here when you have a system that doesn't work and everyone knows that it doesn't work you don't evaluate it you continue that system and you uh, uh, you, you, you criticize other people who have a better system than yours have something to say uh, plenty to say. Yes, no. well, say. You may, you may. Uh, no, I, I would agree. I, the, the only thing I would say is uh, two points. One, just to answer with respect to uh, engaging in politics, and I, I can fully uh, empathize, I think, with you. But I think that there are uh, very subtle ways, which are very powerful ways in which to do it, and simply through the art of storytelling. And I think when you can tell stories, especially ones that represent your culture, such a, a deep, long culture, such as India, such as one, of course, that exists also in parts of the Arab world, uh, and to go, but a lot of the old stories have very modern themes. I mean, you just take and something which I've done in a film company which I established was a lot of research, say, on the 11 different versions of the 1001 Arabian Nights. It's incredible when you look and you see how diverse those themes are and how so much of them relate to today. Why? Because it's all human stories. And humans haven't changed that much. Context has changed, but humans have not changed that much. But so so uh, a historical way of doing it. And just to move to your point about the short-termism, I agree with you that business has suffered. Uh, I mean, you know, or let's say societies have suffered because of businesses acting on short-termism. But I do genuinely believe that we have an opportunity today to embrace the uh, culture of social enterprise whereby people realize that unless you're in a casino, short-termism is not working. And the only way to build sustainable and scalable businesses, the idea being that it'll be profitable for longer, is if you make sure that the impact is not just on the bottom line, but they said the triple bottom line, the profit, but also the, the social or the people and the planet uh, or the environment. So the triple P. And I think that that's where you can have incredibly powerful social businesses that are focused on using culture as a form of diplomacy. But I, Mr. Baghdad, uh, if you may, I think you, the way you speak, you speak freely, you come here, you say exactly what you want, you are, you, you're not politically correct, so you are the best of the Indian democracy. So it's, it, in your country you can be a democrat, you can be free, and there you are. I, yeah, and I'm not the only one. There are others. I know you're not the only one. But I think it's one. the newer generation who are, who are native to the social media, who are native to um, certain technologies that have come in, and we know the pulse, and we can see I'm not the only one feeling it. Mm -hmm. And so we don't feel so alone, you know, to be very frank with you. And linked to that, and I want to ask you this, because you're talking about the Middle East, and we have not discussed it at all when we talk of culture there. A big aspect of their culture is their religion, the Islam religion. And we... And that's always something artists have had trouble with, uh, especially when I talk about, of course, there have been cases of where they have, uh, leave the extreme cases of art. But even things where certain reforms are required, certain interpretations, any religion can be interpreted in 20 different ways. If a little more modern approach is required, a liberal Islamism has not caught up. And I, like you said, they, maybe they shouldn't have asked for democracy, they should ask for rule of law. One could even argue they could have maybe asked for a more liberal or depends when are do you think that happening or why does why do I, why haven't we seen a liberal Islamic movement whereas so many people have been thinking the need for it why does do you think what is your thoughts on that look uh, religion is a very strong 
word, but I, I, what I would like to say is uh, that I think there is a, a symbiotic relationship between faith and culture. And I think that that yeah. applies anywhere around the world. Uh, where it can be misinterpreted a lot of the times is, like I said at the beginning, is where sometimes culture is sometimes uh, m confused with some form of oppression. Such as, you know, I, I use the UAE for example. Our women, especially the ones, you know, who work in government and stuff, they wear the abaya. The abaya is the head cover and they put that. And that's purely cultural. They're not doing that out of religious fervor. That, that is their dress. Just like in the sari in India, where they cover their head, are they doing that because of fear of God? No, it's purely a cultural dress, but where that sometimes gets confused with oppression and then it, it creates political, uh, let's say, uh, valleys between two nations, uh, is sometimes where I think it, it is danger. And you know what? It's nobody's fault but our own. What I mean by that is because that means that we have failed to communicate what it is that our culture is. Communicate either through music or through film or documentary or books. And so if there's a failure of understanding of culture, it's only our failure. And, and that's why I think there's a huge opportunity. Oui, Eric. No, moi je... uh, On this issue of faith, uh, obviously people have faith in God and a superior being and all the rest of it, but there's something else which is confidence. What is confidence? It is uh, common faith. It is uh, the reference uh, to a higher being. And we talked about pride earlier on. I've uh, thought about uh, the origin of the word pride. It comes from the Latin word ferus, and there is a, a savage, a savagery there. Uh, uh, pride is something which isn't always uh, healthy. Uh, it, there, there's uh, ferociousness there. You, you want to go beyond yourself. You want to do something special. And when you, can, when you see a city which is proud of itself, uh, people actually go beyond themselves. I participated in a project uh, over the past couple of years uh, of uh, the construction of the A320 uh, Airbus. And everyone who was um, involved in building that plane thought that they were building the best plane in the world. And the, uh, the, the, the de depression is thinking that you are worth less than you are. Pride is thinking that you're worth more than you are. And uh, what we have to do in culture is to get people who think less of themselves to think more of themselves. And that is true of a city too, because I think uh, states are too distant and they are not united enough. There, there is a question of space that the state has to leave people. And the right space, I think, is the city, is the metropolis. And the question is, a nation is not uh, a sum of Singapore's. And you can see that in France, where you have regional metrop metropolises here, uh, elsewhere in France, and you have uh, uh, cities of 30 to 40, 50,000 people who are trying to live together and uh, they're going to find it difficult because the metropolises are going to attract the best talents. So it's the question of the space, the right space is very, very important because there is no common history if we don't know what we're talking about in terms of the, the, the reference space. And I was going to say too, there can be no thriving uh, cultural life if uh, there is not the uh, the the revolution that we must all live through, which is the cultural revolution, which is equality between men and women. And as long as we don't have equality between men and women, culture cannot thrive. Would you agree with that? Uh, no, no, absolutely. I mean, look, uh, you, 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 you can't have, you, agree with me. you cannot have a cultural revolution if you're not, if you're ignoring 50% of your population. You. That said, though, what I will say is uh, you cannot have economic development without, uh, you know, uh, you can't have any, you can't have rule of law with ignoring 50%. Uh, there is, a, again, though, like I, I would say, as I said before, sometimes a misunderstanding. I would say, and I would argue, that, say, in some parts of the Middle East, including, say, in the Gulf today, policies are more progressive for women than they are in many parts of Europe. Uh, we, have, I, I, we have many situations. We have a law, for example, in the UAE, where every single public company you has to have... You want me to, to tell have... you something? I think it's a joke. 
You're telling no, no, a joke. No, 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 no really, right no, genuinely. No, it's genuinely. impossible because but if women some, don't, does, don't have the same statistics. rights, how can they do it? I can give you some statistics. Uh, for example, we have a, a, a youth parliament in the in the in, in the uh, UAE, 56% of which are girls. We have uh, four. Uh, yes, but they don't have, have the same ministers. rights when they when they, when they are born. So if they don't have the same rights as, as the boy, according to how who? can do? According to your law. I, I, I think you should read the law. I mean, I, well, I have. I've read it. But, uh, it's in the yeah. So, I, but I, but like I said, you see, all this the Islamic is, country, it's the same. What I will say is, I well, no, I mean, I think that's a, a generalization. But well, but, it, but, it has to be generalized. Unfortunately, we yes. would like exceptions, but we don't see them. I, I'll go back to what I said before, and that is really that uh, the f the reason that you are misinformed is our fault. The reason, th the reason that, yeah. The reason that, that, that there is that perception is only our fault. And I think, of course, there's tremendous injustice which goes on in many parts of the world, for not just related to this issue, but we have problems. Uh, but I think beyond, you see, it's human nature to fear what they don't understand. That's why and, and I think, and well, I think you fear women because yes. you don't understand women. If you should, under, you should understand women, you would be so happy to be very close. No, 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 it's okay. This is healthy. This is healthy. You see, if I didn't understand women, I wouldn't be smiling. <laughs> Donc, je pense que no, 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 uh, yeah. votre obligation, c'est de... Your obligation is to invite Denise to your country as quickly as you possibly can. Okay, you have to invite Denise to your country so that she can see actually what goes on there. That's the answer. Nouveau métier, c'est agent de voyage. I have a new business, and that's being a travel agent. So, uh, and and don't cover your hair either. He's he's not disagreeing with you. I think he's saying. Uh, I mean, attempts like Al Jazeera, which has been very successful. I mean, I, it's true that we don't know some of the things that are happening over there, and there's a certain perception and. Um, and misconceptions. I mean, it, it's not just, it's uh, many parts. We, we think Indians have elephants and snake charmers and French people have wine and cheese all the time. That is actually true, actually. <laughs> so, you know, we, we, we try to uh, do quick shortcuts in trying to stereotype people. And I think there's a lot of material for artists to really do this. The artists need to bridge these gaps. And, and tell stories and tell songs and music and 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 I would say even Twitter and the twi Twitter is the new literature and Facebook all these things can tell the world that things are are quite different like the Iranian film industry for example it's there so they, things are happening and as long as people are working trying their best don't forget politics is a very powerful force mm -hmm. so it's very rare that culture becomes more powerful than politics you're dealing with somebody who could who could prosecute you in regime, so it's very easy to pass judgment in a free lay nation about places which are not free. Hmm. But when you're under impression, free will goes out of the window. So you know. Nous allons maintenant demander uh, à la... Now I'm going to ask uh, if there are three questions from the audience. Just three questions, please. Yes, please, sir. Into a microphone, please. discussion. However, I feel saddened with two things. Every time I come to the Forum de Avenue, I find that most French people and a lot of European people equate culture and better culture with subsidy and state financing. Culture is not about that. Culture is a living organism. Culture is a sum total, a gestalt of beliefs, traditions, heritage, and the social change which has taken place over centuries. So culture can never be submerged. Please understand that the moment you start seeking patronage from the state to propagate your culture or to save your culture, you are treading on water. Why is it for six years I hear this constant cry from European uh, uh, artists and other uh, uh, cultural activists that there is a constant need for state intervention in the form of subsidy or, or, or the thing. It is not about what the gentleman uh, said about uh, developing new structures. That's a simplistic way of putting it. Who will create new structures? It's the people. And it's the culture which will then determine, which will help people reform.
Reform, all major reformations, all revolutions stem from people. And what do people are uh, uh, largely symbolized by? It is by their beliefs, by their tradition, by their heritage, by what they are entertained with, by what they are informed with. So it is because it's important that we as artists and we as practitioners of culture understand our power, the power to subvert politics. Unless we believe that we can do it, we will constantly seek aid and feel disappointed. I think that should be a primary theme for, for Europe, that you do not need to seek constant subsidy. One of the reasons why India is got, has the artisanal culture, the, the folk culture, the folk traditions have survived 5,000 years is because there is very little state subsidy. Because the state is more occupied with trying to look after people, as, as Chetan had pointed out. In his, and it's culture which provides them hope. It's culture which provides them with ambition. It's culture which provides them with the, the tools of change. So let's all concentrate and debate how we can reform culture in a more contemporary manner so that it can be used for socio-economic change and not constantly bicker about, you know, this city needs transformation. Please understand, when we talk of a country like India, you talk about metropolises. Please, we have a dozen cities which have population of more than 50 million people. A dozen cities with a population of more than 50 million people. They are the metropolises of the tomorrow, not a half a million people. So please get your uh, worldview in right perspective. Mr. Arsena will answer to you. Monsieur, je suis... Je suis... Well, sir, I am uh, upset about your anger, especially as uh, your anger is about an opinion which I didn't uh, offer. Uh, there have been... Uh, um, pas vous que je... No, may I finish, please? There are ministers who could have been called ministers of propaganda, but that era is over, and uh, Europe doesn't have the monopoly of ministers of propaganda. There have been ministers of propaganda everywhere. And I didn't say, and I didn't say that a culture could only live on subsidies. I simply said that there had to be rules of the game. And when you talk about the people, I am a little worried because the people is too much. That goes too far. And that uh, lead, leads to, to shortcuts, uh, to uh, false ideas. If no, just just let me finish. Don't 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 get uh, don't get excited, uh, sir. Uh, we'll have lunch together. We'll have dinner together. We're in Avignon. Don't get don't get so excited about it. You're excited about subsidies, but I wasn't talking about subsidies. What I said was the role of the Minister of Culture, and here there is a Minister of Culture, and uh, the role of public rules is that there are some areas which are not areas which uh, should be in the market because there are important costs, and yet those, those things have to have some role in a, in, in a country. But I'm not uh, advocating subsidies for everything. Far from it. Far from it. This Whether we're talking about uh, subsidies of large companies or subsidies from the public purse, basically, uh, I really don't see who is doing more propaganda. I think I think you have misunderstood me. I have uh, what I pointed was that this structure. If you talk about budgetary cuts and and uh, uh, this uh, you know culture, that's only one dimension. I'm not disputing your uh, your uh, statement. I am just saying that we need to look beyond that. Th th that is what we I'm agree. trying to say. We agree. In yeah. fact, we all agree. Let me give the floor to the uh, Minister of Culture from South Africa. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Program Director. I was initially told that I was going to speak in this session this evening, uh, but in terms of the program, I'll speak tomorrow. I just want to make uh, just a few points because the topic of uh, 
culture and politics is something that is really um, that's something that I pursue a lot. Uh, firstly, to say that uh, I agree with the speakers that uh, you know politics are influenced a lot by culture uh, because culture is about who we are as a people. It's about our way of life. Uh, and often in South Africa, when I speak about this topic, I always say culture is the soul of the nation. Um, and therefore, it influences everything we do. But there's one other point I wanted to make that, uh, you know, politics can also be used to oppress people culturally. And that's where the danger is because uh, culture influences politics, so people use politics to uh, infect, uh, suppress people, or force their own cultures on other people. Yeah. Uh, if you look at a country like South Africa, under apartheid, black people in the main uh, were subjugated in the name of culture. Uh, their languages were oppressed. Um, and their cultural expressions suppressed. So what we need to do, and that's, this is my last point, what we need to do going forward is to ensure that we use culture to enhance democratic rule. I think that's one important thing that we must say, that we use culture as a weapon to foster human rights um, and make sure that we use culture to strengthen relations between nation states, uh, the whole issue of cultural diplomacy. Uh, so I think that's what we need to debate going forward because there is power in culture. And how do we use this power to make the world better? And th that's the point I wanted to make, but otherwise I will speak tomorrow. Thank you Thank very you. much. Thank you very much. Alors je crois que... Well, I think uh, that that... There's another question here. Yes, please, sir. The last question, then. Last question. Because I think uh, people want to uh, move on, uh, perhaps, to the gastronomic culture of the evening. Last question. I'm not going to talk about gastronomic culture even though uh, this is the place uh, in the Palais of Pape where culture and gastronomy uh, m were linked uh, for many centuries. Claudia Cassin, I'm uh, a European director of radio and television. What uh, strikes me in the current uh, era is that uh, we are going through an unprecedented change in the world. I think uh, the recent period for, era, for, for, for the more recent period, year, was uh, 1480 to 1520 where the world uh, shifted towards Europe. And now, uh, the, in this new change, uh, people are losing their cultural references. And therefore, we need, more than ever, a, an outlook, um, a, a sense of what brings us together. And uh, people who uh, are cultural carriers uh, have that mission to bring us all together. Uh, Franzweig, uh, Stefan Zweig talked about the world before, in 1913, and what happened after that was the World War, and we must avoid that. But intellectuals, the trade unionists, the politicians, academics, and my generation uh, all thought that they would cooperate, uh, and they didn't. They knew everything, and they did nothing, and we are in the same situation in Europe today, everywhere there is the rise of populism. Everywhere intellectuals are saying, we're in danger. Everywhere politicians are focusing on the need to react, and nobody is doing anything. Nobody is doing anything. And I think a forum like this, cultural forum, must be a forum of resurrection. Because if we don't have that sense of resurrection, if we don't think of our future together over and above national borders, and in Europe, and in public television in particular in Europe, uh, the, uh, the politicians want national productions because they want to satisfy their national electorates. And that's a vicious circle, whereas the specificity of Europe is to have a common culture which goes beyond national frontiers. 
a, a European culture. And I think the issue for us today, uh, people who uh, carry culture, who are committed to culture, is to rethink what brings us together, what binds us together. And we must start by doing that on a European scale. Because if we don't do that, we shall not be influential. And uh, people who uh, say that they are liberal, people who say that they are progressist in India, in uh, the Emirates, they need that because we are in a globalized world. And what we have to do today, therefore, is to realize that democracy lives in complex conditions. French democracy depends on German democracy. And th that is a sum of very complicated interactions politics, culture, but also individual responsibility. And what I'm concerned about today is that uh, I don't think that anyone is really committed to thinking about that complexity in which there are so many difficult subjects, European-wide and worldwide. So that's the subject for me, and I'd like to know how each one of you thinks about that and uh, is going to respond to that. Alors, une minute. Well, one minute, one minute for each one of you to conclude, please. One minute to conclude. Mr. Jafar. Thank you. Mr. Jafar first. I want to, say you, to tell you something. Yes. <laughs> when we were arguing, I love you too. Nothing was personal because <laughs> no, I think you're a very, you're a gentleman and a very moderate man, and I'm. <laughs> you can explain things to me. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. No, unfortunately, some of the uh, time the translation was being cut off, so I couldn't hear everything. But uh, on that point, if I have one minute to summarize, generally, on the conclusion, you know, uh, uh, somebody who I've had the pleasure and honor of working with recently uh, in cultural endeavors is Quincy Jones, who's a you know, famous uh, music producer. And he gave me some advice many years ago that only actually really, you know, more recently started to really resonate. And he said, you know, uh, wherever you go in the world, uh, you, first of all, you have to really go to know. That's critical. Even with the pace of technology today, you might get a taste, but you have to genuinely make an effort to go to absorb a culture. And when you are there, he gave three pieces of advice, which I just want to repeat. One is eat the food that they eat, listen to the music that they listen to, and try your best to learn at least 30 words from their language. And that will genuinely give you that uh, snapshot into, as it were, their culture and be able to identify. And uh, I invite you, Denise, to come. I know you haven't visited our part of the world yet, so I invite you to come and visit it. What are the 30 words? Ah, no, any 30 words. Okay. Any 30 words in a language, because you, through the, even the pronunciation, through the style, through the way, you get an insight into their culture. Oh, okay, well, it has been um, a great experience to be here, not only because it's a great audience, but also, you know, um, whatever we, the few of us in India are trying to do, we used to feel that nobody really cares about this, but to have a, such a big conference with the theme around this subject um, gives us a lot of effort, a uh, lot of energy, a lot of inspiration to go back and work doubly hard to make this happen and, and, and use culture the, to subvert politics, someone said, and to really work in it. And culture is everywhere now, and the new technologies are allowing us, if you, I don't know if you noticed, but if you could just have the tweets back on screen. Um, I am guilty of tweeting in the middle of the session, but that's just the way the new generation likes it. If you can have the previous slide where you had the tweets uh, coming in, if, no? the issue missed it but uh, you may notice it when they flash the tweets now so and I've survived it and I think it's it's great that all you guys think that way please help support us yeah see the first one over there so um, so thank you so much I think thank you for making me look listening to me two million Two million followers. Two million followers. Have you realize that? No, no. That's probably the number of Indians. It's probably the number of Indians born every day or something. I'm jealous for that. I'm jealous for that. No, no, no. C'est quand même énorme. No, but that's that's enormous. So I have great respect for you, Mr. Bagat. Great respect. What, a, what, 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 what am I learning? Apparently, there's, n there's no more game. Stop tweeting.
Fémen. Oh. Je traduis pas ça, là. Ça a l'air des Fémen, en plus. Ça a l'air d'une Fémen en bas, là. De, de la politique que j'aime. There's a definition of politics which I which I love, It's, which is the art of the possible. There's the possible uh, because uh, you always compare the possible to the real, and you have to uh, look at what is real and do what's possible. And then there's the culture. And if there's not a minimum of culture in the, that comparison between the possible and the real, then the real can't be changed. And then, what is the role of a minister of culture? Is to make the art make art possible, and that makes it possible for politics to have an influence on real life. So culture makes art possible. So I'm quite willing to audit the French Ministry of Culture, which I'm sure will be uh, even less read than the tremendously good report of Monsieur Pierre Lescure that I referred to earlier on. Alors, merci de votre attention. Uh... Thank you very much for your attention. It was a pleasure to be your moderator.